Welcome to Turning Back the Clock. We're on location at the Nelson Museum at our Loggers, Mill Owners and Communities exhibition. For those of you who have been housebound with the flu or weren't able to come down for some reason, we thought we'd give you the highlights of the exhibition in today's program. The forest is a big part of our local history in the West Kootenays. The trees themselves, a legacy that we had from nature. Beautiful, large cedars, beautiful spruces and firs. A forest that has been of great value, of great pleasure, a, a real treasure for our area. And a bone of contention, as we all know. Maybe some of the things that we have said in the exhibition will give some light on the history of the use of the forest, and that'll guide us to some ways to the future uses. The men, the loggers, who came into our area from all over the world, from Japan, from Sweden, from Germany, from back east, from the United States, from Britain, wonderful series of men, strong, uh, able to put up with great hardships, hard workers, uh, real builders of our communities here, cared about what they were doing, worked very hard and have left quite a legacy in, in, of folklore, of tales, and fortunately of some photos. Those early men had tools, hand tools, and their main power besides themselves and their manpower was horses. And those horses were active in our West Kootenay woods right up until the 1950s in many locations. And are still being used today by a number of small horse loggers on special areas where there can only be that kind of power because of uh, conservation needs. And the technology doubled over in many cases. In this one, the horses are pulling the logging um, truck on rails in the beginnings of the logging railways in our area. From hand tools, a one-man crosscut saw here. We went to power tools and the primitive power saws that were so heavy for men to handle. When the man was finished his work, he could come home to his bunkhouse. From actual photographs, Peter Picorni, uh, the Capitol Theatre set designer, has built us this bunk corner, uh, three bunk um, section of a bunkhouse for people. We, we kind of imagined that uh, three, these, these would be men working together and sleeping in these bunks in their ticks filled with straw, with their old primitive blankets. And we even imagined their personalities as this man with a candle was studying his correspondence courses at night. He missed his family so much he had their pictures on his bed. He prayed to have the strength to get through the days. He had his ointments and his liniments to help him get, get through the pain of the work. He tried to keep clean. He washed out his long underwear and his socks and hung them up. This man was a little bit different character. His girlfriend's picture hanging up. He was a member of the one big union, Lumber and Camp Workers Industrial Union. And he is soulless at night was to have a bit of beer. With their big cork boots, these men kept themselves 
from falling in the woods, but every night they had to dry them out because of the wetness of our woods by the fire in their bunkhouse. So you can imagine what it was like, the smell of drying long underwear and leather boots, beer, <laughs> the results of camp food, lots of beans and bacon. Not exactly your most ideal life, I'm sure. We owe those men a lot. Okay. Okay. We've been very fortunate in the model builders in Nelson, especially in Bert Learmont well known for his Sternwheeler models. He constructed this model of a Bridges and Fishers Mill down on the Nelson waterfront. It was there in 1899, and we had actual photographs of it. It shows the mill pond where the logs were kept, the jack ladder bringing the logs up into the mill, and even the little saw and the little piles of lumber, completed lumber that were, that were carried away. Nelson had a lot of mills on the waterfront. It's interesting now that there isn't one at all. Uh, this one was at the foot of Hall Street. It was the Nelson Planing and Saw Mills. It was owned by Mr. Hillier, who was a member of city council. And the value-added people would be interested to know that at that time they had a planer, a lathe, a circular saw, a three-sided sticker, a mortising machine, and a smaller circular saw. And they made doors, windows, staircases, blinds, screens, mantles, bar tops, mouldings, and office fittings. In 1898, they hired about 50 people. G.O. Buchanan was well known in both Nelson and Caslow before he moved to the coast. It was his lumber that built the, fr built the first frame buildings in Nelson. And he also built the bridge, his lumber built the bridge that crossed Ward Creek and basically created Baker Street as the cent center of Nelson. Mr. Buchanan, his first mill was at Harrop. It was washed away in the flood of 1894. He then located again to Caslow. But this beautiful photo of Caslow shows him in the area where the marina is today in Caslow. John Brown Winlaw is another person who was, has roots in Nelson and in the area. He was a back from back east from Toronto, came out and began the mill that gave Winlaw its name. Located near the railway tracks at Winlaw. He took timbers from all up and down around the Slocan Valley before relocating to the Windell area over near Creston. His son Nels took over his business and uh, operated it for many years. Here's the man that worked at Mr. A.G. Lambert's mill, which was up at the Sproul Creek here in Tagum area. Great bo look, looking bunch of men, aren't they? The Lamberts used a large flume to bring their logs down out of the uh, one of the side valleys off uh, Sproul Creek to a mill pond down at the bottom. From there the lumber, the uh, logs were put into the mill. W.W. Powell, a Spokane businessman, realized the potential of the wo wonderful white pine trees in our area. He marketed them to the Eddie Match Company in Hull, Quebec, and match blocks were manufactured in Nelson. This was a kind of work that women could do, is preparing the match blocks, clearing out all the uh, knots and, and any imperfections in the blocks. And it was a very good source of employment at a time when there was very hard for women to find such work. 
he operated in Nelson and from 1921 until 1961. Another Ontario businessman who set up mills in our area is William Waldy Sr. He lived in Nelson, but he worked in Castlegar at the site of uh, Sprout's Landing used to be. He set up a sawmill that operated for many years and the company itself was sold to Selgar and has become the Selgar operation today. Another of Bert Learmont's fine models is this model of the lookout, typical forestry lookout, that was used for spotting the fires. The Forest Service had these on the major peaks and they looked around, the lonely forest ranger looked around to all the surrounding area and had a little device called a firefinder inside where he could plot the location of a fire on a map. Living in these things was very hairy in the summers. Lightning storms. One fellow described being tossed out of his bed by lightning and then again being hit again by lightning on the floor when he was lying there and wondering what he'd done wrong. <laughs> the logging truck made a big difference in our local West Kootenai woods. It meant that the small mills up in the hills were eventually phased out and the milling was centralized in larger locations where they have developed the high-tech machinery. The early logging trucks with their heavy hard rubber wheels and or metal wheels even in the earliest days were very scary on those mountain roads. Uh, it took a lot of fortitude to drive them. This photo by Ursula Heller shows a modern logging truck and grappler at work showing the size of the logs that can now be carried and the almost there's no men <laughs> except the drivers and you can see that the technical aspects of the business have really changed the uh, ability to get the trees out of the forests. Okay. The uh, increased cut, the lesser yield, the danger to watersheds have all caused problems in our area as well as the rest of British Columbia. And people have had to make stand, make a stand, how they felt. And this has led to our land use plan for the area as a, an attempt at compromise between people's different aims for the forest. Right from the earliest days, there has been an attempt at value-added industry for our area. Boat builders and, as we said in the earlier picture, the uh, plain, planers making uh, sashes and doors and mantles and so forth. And this again is being uh, looked at as the way to create more jobs for every cubic meter of trees. And uh, through the value-added wood conf conference that was held uh, last spring here in Nelson, I mean over in Creston in our area, uh, there was it been generated a whole new interest in getting this going for our area and for our province. Our West Kootenai communities were begun mostly by mining, sustained by logging and lumbering afterwards, and now have their diverse economies, including tourism and small manufacturing, the service industries, and so forth. But it's always the forest that supplies our water, our uh, special ambience of our area, and which has, will continue to be an important part of our economy for a long time to come. On behalf of Charles Jeans, the curator of our exhibition, and myself, Sean Lamb, I would like to thank all those who shared their memories, their photographs, their work, their model building experience, and all their memories with us for this exhibition. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you.